So I wanted to start off by sharing how I annotated War and Peace. The BBC miniseries for War and Peace was incredible, so I want to align the sections of my edition of the book with the episodes so that you can watch them while you're reading. I want to dive into some very brief summaries of the different sections. No spoilers, but focusing more on my reactions to the different things that happen. Here are some of the quotes that I liked. If I can do it, anyone can do it. Fun fact, I can actually be one of those pretentious snobs that says I read War and Peace. I really wanted to accomplish this because War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy is often referred to as the best book ever written. So I knew that I had to read it and experience it for myself. It's really surprising that I would even read War and Peace because I have said on more than one occasion that I hate reading books about war. I'm just not into the whole war plot. I have powers. Oh, I have powers too. Let's have a war. And I'm just kind of burnt out on that. But again, I had FOMO and I didn't want to miss out on the greatest book ever written. More than anything, I want to highlight to you that if you have interest in experiencing this book for yourself, then you should absolutely do it. I was shocked at how easily I was able to grasp the concepts and understand the language. One of the keys to success that I had in reading this book was utilizing spark notes alongside my reading journey, and it made all the difference. The biggest complexity of this book is that there are something like 559 characters, 200 of them being historical figures, so it's really hard to keep track of. Having spark notes by my side was really beneficial to keeping all the characters in line, understanding different plot points that I was missing, picking up on themes and symbolism I never would have grasped without it. I really recommend it because although it's not complicated language, there's a lot of depth and meaning that could be missed. I had a lot of thoughts while reading this book, if you couldn't tell. So I wanted to start off by sharing how I annotated War and Peace. As always, I have a color key at the beginning where I write down what all the different colors of tabs mean. Being a book about war, I kind of assumed there'd be a lot of scenes that would make me sad. So the first color that I wanted to tab was blue for moments that did make me sad. There's actually not that many blue tabs throughout this book, so I don't think I even cried until maybe like the last fourth of the book. Pink indicated moments that I loved. Green was a very important color because those are little stickies when a new character was introduced. It was important to me to try and keep track of those 559 characters, although it was a little hard to distinguish who was important and who was just a supporting character. If you're not familiar with Russian literature, something that I learned is that there's so many different variations of the same name that it can get really confusing. Orange were for different quotes that I liked, and there was definitely a lot of them. Purple tabs indicate different examples of the theme, and when I was looking it up on Sparknotes, that's where I found out the themes I wanted to keep an eye out for. And that was the irrationality of human motives and the meaning of life. Now that you know some of the things that I kept an eye out for while I was reading it, I want to tell you a little bit of what it's about. And honestly, the best description is on the inside cover of my edition. And it says, at a lavish party in St. Petersburg in 1805, amid the glittering crystal and chandeliers, the room buzzes with talk of the prospect of war. Soon battle and terror will engulf the country and the destinies of its people will be changed forever. War and Peace has as its backdrop, Napoleon's invasion of Russia and at its heart, three of literature's most memorable characters. Pierre, a quixotic young man in search of life's meaning. Prince Andre, a cynical intellectual transformed by suffering and war, and the bewitching Natasha, whose impulsiveness threatens to destroy her happiness. That is a brief summary of what these 1400 pages are about. I want to dive into some very brief summaries of the different sections. No spoilers, but focusing more on my reactions to the different things that happen. Also, the BBC miniseries for War and Peace was incredible, so I want to align the sections of my edition of the book with the episodes so that you can watch them while you're reading. It's really, really cool. It enhanced my reading experience of War and Peace, and because I timed it pretty well, there weren't too many spoilers and I could watch them at the same time. 
I think the BBC miniseries was fantastic and actually a really good representation of the storyline. You're not going to catch the same level of philosophical reflections. So a lot of the themes in this book, you're not gonna get. I didn't cry at all in the series. It didn't make me feel nearly as emotional, which I think we can all expect, right? We all know the book is better. In this case, I think if you just want a high level introduction into the story of what War and Peace is about, you can check out the BBC series. But if you love history, military strategy, if you love kind of the philosophical meaning of life discussion and diving into that, definitely invest the time because this is an impactful book. I read this edition here, which is the Penguin Classics Deluxe Edition. It is translated by Anthony Briggs. So that is the one that I'm going to be using when I'm referring to page numbers. Also, um, I break it down into volumes, but I think other editions refer to them as books. So the terminology might be different, but I think the breakdown is going to be the same. So keep that in mind when I'm going through these. I'm going to be going through my Instagram where I outlined a lot of my reactions and I had some quite brilliant and cute pictures to go along with it. So I'm going to be reading off my iPad for a lot of this because it's just too much to memorize. Kicking us off with volume one of War and Peace. When it comes to the BBC miniseries, this took me up to volume one, part two, up to chapter 20, which was page 200 in my edition. Episode two of the BBC series took me up to volume two, part one, chapter five, or page 338. Part one of volume one is really where you get a taste for how many characters there are. It could be very overwhelming. I recommend keeping notes. I looked up a character map online, but unfortunately it had a ton of spoilers. So it would give me like the character's names and then tell me if they lived or died. And so that kind of ruined a bunch of it for me. So just be careful if you're gonna look up a character map. In part one, I loved the gossip society. There was inheritance drama that was really fun too. There was some drunken debauchery and there were some parent-child relationship dynamics that I thought were really interesting in part one as well. Part two, I'm going to refer to my handy dandy notes here. Some of the things I noted that in chapter eight, there's a paragraph that starts with one step across that dividing line. So like the one between the living and the dead and you enter an unknown world of suffering and death. This whole section was so beautiful and so well done. This is where you get kind of a taste of Leo. I'm gonna call him Leo, hope that's okay. We're like this now, we've spent a lot of time together. This is where you get a taste of the impactful writing that you're going to experience throughout the course of this book. There's lots of war stuff in part two, but primarily we follow Prince Andre and we learn a lot about him and his motivations, which he is driven by glory. We also spend some time with Nikolai and I got to admit, I did not like him in the beginning. I think he's like 20 years old. He's very spineless, kind of the exact opposite of Andre at this point. In part three of volume one, there was a proposal that really made me laugh. There's also a big battle scene and one of our primary characters is badly injured. We also saw an infatuation or more like an obsession with the czar from one of our characters. And it was so intense that I was thinking to myself, yo, yo, be cool, bro, be cool. According to Sparknotes, in this section, the foremost idea is the disillusionment of idealists. That wraps up volume one. See, not too bad, right? You could totally do this. Here are some of the quotes that I liked in volume one. There's nothing more important for a young man than the company of intelligent women. If everybody fought for nothing but his own convictions, there wouldn't be any wars. We are asleep until we fall in love. I'm telling you, if we could know what's going to happen after we're dead, not one of us would be scared of dying. Volume two brought on the drama. So let's get into that one and see what you can expect. Starting off with how this volume compares to the BBC miniseries, 
Episode three of the series took me in the book to about volume two, part two, chapter 11, which is page 410 in my edition. If you read to about there and then watch the episode, nothing will be spoiled when you pick up the book again. Episode four of the mini series took me to volume two, part five, pretty much exactly. Up to part five, you're gonna be okay here. Episode five of the BBC series took me to the last page of volume two, page 663. In volume two, here is a breakdown of the five parts. Starting off with part one, according to Sparknotes, just as the last sections explored the disillusionment with ideals of war and leadership, this section explores disillusionment with marriage. Drama. There were proposals, a gambling scandal, duels, lots of drama, lots of vengeance. In part two, there is a secret society and it's very spooky, which is a different vibe from the rest of the book. Definitely some religious undertones here that are, well, it's not subtle, but I think you're introduced to some disillusions with their religious beliefs as well. Part three, there is a love match that I did not see coming. Our girl Natasha is growing up now and she is catching a lot of attention from men. Sparknote says, Natasha's great power lies not in specific attributes, but in her extraordinary vitality. Natasha works below the consciousness of these men, like a vital force beyond rational understanding. I like her. In part four of volume two, I got a little bit bored because there was this whole hunting montage that I just didn't care about and I really don't like hunting. So I checked out a little bit there. There is a conflict and a parent-child relationship, which kind of bummed me out too. I was also screaming into my book. Have you ever heard of a budget? In part five, I was just crying for Princess Maria and really hoping that things turned around for her soon. Helene is such a bitch and I just want her to leave soon. Can we cancel her? Can we cancel Helene? Because Girl needs to go. I had so many feelings at the end of this part. I was just screaming, what are you thinking? The impulsive decisions by one of our characters, you know it's not gonna go well for them and you know we're just building up the drama. I was just high energy at this point. My favorite quotes from volume two. The whole world is split in two for me now. One half is her and it's all happiness, hope and light. The other is not her and it's all misery and darkness. Oh, swoon. Oh, you should always be nice to the husbands of pretty women. I ignore everybody unless they are useful or dangerous. And most of them are dangerous, especially the women. The only thing we can know is that we don't know anything. And that is the summit of human wisdom. What's right and what's wrong is something we can't decide. People keep making mistakes and they always will, especially when it comes to right and wrong. For the first time in his life, Pierre was struck by the endless variety of men's minds, which guarantees that no truth is ever seen the same way by any two persons. If you want to be happy, you have to believe in the possibility of happiness, and I do believe in it now. Let the dead bury the dead, and while ever there is life, you must live and be happy. This brings us to volume three, and I'm gonna tell you right now, this was not my thing. I don't like books about war, I think particularly because I don't like the battles or the battlefield, and that's where this volume takes place. If you do like history and the strategy behind war though, I think you'll really like this section. Starting off with how this compares to the BBC series, we have episode six, which took us right up to the Battle of Borodino, but the fighting hadn't started yet. For episode seven, 30 minutes in, closed out volume three, but then it started to spill into volume four a little bit and I turned it off because I didn't want to be spoiled. So I kind of have to figure that one out since it crosses over like during the episode. In part one, Princess Maria had not caught a break yet and those peasants were complete assholes to her. When it comes to Pierre, I found it fascinating how there were different elements of the supernatural when it came to him because that was not a theme that carried out for the rest of the book. There was a 666 premonition, which is what I'm referring to here. Part two, this is where a lot of the battle scenes were and what was dissuading me from originally picking up the book. This was essentially a narration of the history and not so much from the POV of our characters. There were a couple passages that did move me though when we were humanizing the enemy and I thought those were very insightful. When it comes to part three, Helene does not let us down in being an absolute jerk. Checking in with Pierre, he has gone batshit crazy, but as volume three winds down, he does make me a little bit proud. 
The Rostovs are just an amazing family and I get so attached to them and really worried that something bad is going to happen to them. I mean, we have war in the title, so you kind of know they're gonna get strained, but throughout this whole story, they have the most beautiful family relationship. Some insight from Sparknotes. Through Pierre's example, Tolstoy highlights the human instinct for solidarity and togetherness that opposes the contrary instinct for division and bloodshed. Also from Sparknotes, the idea of renunciation of surrendering the external valuables of one's life recurs frequently in these chapters as Tolstoy's symbol of spiritual achievement. This renunciation is both private and public, both emotional and military. Such surrender astonishes Napoleon, who in his materialistic fashion cannot fathom what a country would prefer spiritual freedom to material loss of property. That's what you can expect in volume three, but let me share some of my favorite quotes. Kings are the slaves of history. If he had learned one lesson from his military experience, it was that in matters of war, the most carefully considered plans count for nothing. Everything depends on how you react to unexpected and unpredictable enemy action. Everything depends on who takes charge and how. There is nothing stronger than those two old soldiers, time and patience. It comes down to this. No more lying. War means war, and it's not a plaything. Otherwise, war will be a nice hobby for idle people and butterfly minds. You can love someone dear to you with human love, but it takes divine love to love your enemy. Volume four is really the heart and the meat of the substance of this book and what Tolstoy is trying to convey. I feel like the earlier volumes are very plot driven. And I mean, in volume four, it is too, because actually on page, 1183, right? So like this much through the book <laughs> is where I cried for the first time. And looking up other reviews and commentary on War and Peace, I'm not alone. This is where a lot of people broke down. There's something that happens that um, it's a side character. It's not even one of our main characters, but a side character dies and it just gutted me. And it was so ugh. I honestly don't have many notes on these last sections because I kind of stopped taking them and really just immersed myself in the reading. A lot of history references, a lot reflecting on how history is reported and really the meaning of life. That theme is prevalent in these last sections and kind of the philosophical inputs of Leo Tolstoy is what makes this book so special. To summarize, I did definitely pick up this book just because I wanted to see what the hype was about for what is called the best book ever written. To date, it's also the longest book I've ever read. I'm really proud of myself for accomplishing it, not just because of the length, but because of the heavy philosophical content because it's a Russian novel with lots of characters, because it's a translated piece of work, all these reasons made me very, very proud to read this. Above all else, I want to repeat what I said in the beginning, and that's if you have any interest in War and Peace, but you're kind of nervous and apprehensive about it, just do it, just try it. I think it's gonna be a lot more approachable than a lot of people think it is. If I can do it, anyone can do it, seriously. It is a great read, very easy to digest, I recommend it and use spark notes. Use spark notes to help you make sure that you're catching everything and understanding everything, following all the characters. Those are really my tips. So thanks so much for watching. I hope you got something out of this. If you've made it to this point in the video, please drop a comment down below if you are interested in War and Peace. If you have read it, I'm curious if you would put it among the best books ever written. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.